Joey, I want to start off with just a page from this final kind of a conclusion of the Rich Dad Poor Dad for Teens book. It was a great opportunity for us to sit with our four daughters and talk through money to get them active. You know, I think they made strides. I'm not going to say that they got everything. No. But I know that this is building blocks. But on page 100 in this book, he had a couple of different parts I wanted to share. Is that okay? Yeah. Go for it. One is the people you spend your time with are your future. Mm. That's super powerful. How, how do you see how the how your life has changed over the last five years just based upon the people you spend your time with? Man, I, I'll tell you what. Um, you and I five years ago compared to where we're at today and who we are, dramatically different. I mean, we were actually just talking about in one of the roundtable uh, inner circle meetings about, man, the, the types of investments and ideas that we know now are a direct correlation to the interviews of the experts that we have been able to spend time with on the show. That is, there's no coincidence to that. That is just literally putting yourself around people that are much smarter and further down the road from you. And that's what I think this book was helping our kids do is to think bigger, hopefully to maybe broaden their horizons so that they will find other people hundred percent that will, will help advance them in all areas of life. So if you're listening to this, I would maybe encourage you to get one of your children involved. Have them listen to this with you. Have them listen to the awkwardness of our four girls who are nervous, <laughs> as you might imagine, to talk into these microphones, to be live on Facebook and YouTube as we were doing this. But also at the same time, know that the discussions that you will have with your child after this will be things that will help advance them. I'm going to go a little bit further in this uh, page. One of the things that Robert Kiyosaki pointed out is that when it comes to climbing financial mountains, most people ask advice from people who are stuck in financial swamps. Mm. And I think it's because a a lot of people have never even known who they should ask for advice. Yeah, 100%. And a lot of times we end up asking advice of people who are not where we want to be because they're not there. Yep. Like when you talk to someone and you're asking for their advice, please ask the ones, uh, get advice from people who are already financially free, if that's what you want to be, who are already successful, if that's what you want to be. He, he went on to say that the way that you do that is you have coaches, you have mentors. And he gave an example that's really good. I, you and I, I really stink at golf. <laughs> And he says, for example, I play golf and I take lessons, but I don't have a full-time coach. This is probably, get this, why I pay money to play golf instead of getting paid to play. I totally resonate with that. (laughs) Well, when you think about that, uh, golfers, professional golfers pay for full-time coaches, which you would think that doesn't make sense. Like they're so good, right? But they get paid to play. So, of course, they need to invest in what they're good at. And anything that you want to get paid to do, you need to have a coach. And whether that's starting young with your kids, like the discussions we're having today, or it's in your own self that you say, hey, look, I need to advance. I need to grow. And that's what we've created within the inner circle. So I'm going to give a plug for that real quick. Go to wealthwallstreet.com forward slash inner circle. That is where you get access to coaches, and that process will help get you, hopefully, to the financial mountain that you're trying to climb. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode with our four daughters and Joey and I. Let's jump in right now. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome into our live episode as we interview our daughters again. This is the third part of Rich Dad Poor Dad for Teens. That's right. And we're going to close it out today. This is going to be uh, hopefully good for you. If you haven't already gone through the first two episodes, go back, do this with your teens. I'd love for you to kind of share with us inside the community, your thoughts and maybe feedback that your kids had from going through this as well. 
By the way, if you're not a part of the community, you should be. It's easy. It's free. Go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash community. You can join today. And uh, like I said, that's where we can, you can DM us directly and let us know you, you heard us on the show. All right, girls, I'm going to go around. I would love for everybody to remind our audience who you are and how old you are. So I'll start with you. Hi, I'm Annie Mure, and I am 15 years old. Hi, I am Alexandria Morgan, and I'm also 15. Hi, I'm Lily Kate Mure, and I'm 13 years old. Hi, I'm Kate Morgan, and I'm 13 too. All right, perfect. So we finished your book. You forgot yourself, Wes. I, they they know who I am. We talk plenty about ourselves. <laughs> They're tired of hearing from us. <laughs> so we finished the book. I, really quickly, before we kind of get into some questions as it related to this third part, overall, what was your take from the whole book as a, as a whole, Kate? You want to jump in there? It was really help, helpful to get to know about all this stuff. It was helpful to get to know about that. What does that mean? You can talk just right into the mic so everybody hear you. Um, I learned a lot of stuff that I didn't know before. Give me one example. I didn't know about the the assets and liabilities and due debts. Okay. How about for you, Annie? I'm going to put you on the spot, too. Give me one thing, one takeaway that you had from the book as a whole. Well, it taught me to look differently at money. Okay. Instead of thinking of it as something I have to earn, it's something I can learn from. And um, I don't have to work just like all the time to earn it. I I can have assets that do the work for me. Okay, good. Zan, how about you? What, after going through the whole book, what's one takeaway that you had? Um, well, I think it's just like that a lot of people can read it because he didn't, the whole book, it was really easy to read. It was, it wasn't like confusing. And so then you could know what he was saying. So you felt like he really did get, the narrative or how would you say that down to the level where you are to be able to read it? Yeah. Like the chapters were really easy to read and understand. Right. Okay. Perfect. How about for you? Like Kate was one takeaway that you had from the book as a whole. It really did help me understand like how, you know, like how, what I'm to do with money. Okay. And like where to put it. Yeah. Well, I'm interested because I know this last chapter, he actually talked a lot about where to put money. And so we're going to get into that. Joey, you've got a handful of questions you want to start off with? Yeah, I, I thought early on he in the chapters uh, 8, 9, and 10 here the, at the end, he talks about the different money-making opportunities that teens have. And I thought this was interesting. He wanted to challenge you to think for yourself. Like, what are some of those jobs that you're interested in? Like what sort of careers do you have interest in? What kind of jobs do teens typically have? And then are there opportunities that you could come up with yourself to create that wasn't a job somebody was going to pay you to do, you were going to like create your own business. So all that being said, I'd love for each of you to go around and say, what was a career that you were interested in that he, he asked you to put down on paper. So why don't we start with you, Kate, and we'll come this way. So, Kate, what was a career that you wrote down? I want to be an architect. I put down architecture. Awesome. Kate, Lily Kate? I put down a writer. Writer? Okay, perfect. Um, right now, I want to be an accountant. Accountant. Okay. All right. Amy? Um, I really want to be an artist. That makes sense because you're really gifted in that. That's good. Um, what he also said that there's opportunities you could create for yourself. So what were some of those that you guys came up with? I'd love to hear your, like your creativity in this. And we'll start with Annie and go that way. Um, well, I did create my own business, Annie Mary Art, where I get to be the artist I want to be and bring artwork to others. Awesome. Zan? Um, a business that I want to create? Yeah. I would, well, I guess I'm helping in the, in the short-term rental business. And um, when me and Kate were little, we made a business where <laughs> we were going to sew some clothes for people if they needed them. No. All right. 
Yeah, we misspelled wedding dresses, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Lily Kate. I am babysitting right now. Okay. So, yeah. You're already doing that? Yeah. Very good. But I want to continue. Okay. Yeah. And Kate? I have been working. We have a staff company, me and my cousins, kind of. When you say staff company, explain that a little bit deeper. So maybe th- in some people context, staff means hiring employees as staff. No, um, like a stick company, we would cut down trees and <laughs> carve them into sticks, and we would burn names. Like walking, them. walking sticks. Yeah, walking. Sticks. Okay, like the ones you hike with. Yeah, like yeah. the real big ones, and they they spend a lot of time like cutting them down, then sanding them. Then you guys actually like burn their names into them, right? Yeah, it's called um. Forest reflections. Forest reflections. Wow, yeah. is that right? Yes. Okay. Man. I didn't know if Mr. Joey just made out a better name or if that was actually the name. Forest <laughs> reflections. Nice. And, and then you actually put some sort of like wax on the uh, on the stick as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're they're really cool. Now here's this is high end custom stuff. Oh uh, yeah, this isn't the kind of stuff you just buy off Amazon that comes straight from China. This is some homemade quality stuff we're talking. American made. Right, like if okay. you, is there a place for people who are listening who would like one of these uh, sticks to order from? Not yet. Not, Ooh. Well, no, that's not the answer. You say yes, just message my dad in the app and I'll send you uh, details. That's what I meant. Okay, exactly. wait a minute. This brings up a good point, Russ. Robert Kiyosaki talked about the art or the skill of selling. R- really quickly, though, I know that we're, that's where you're going. Super, that's, that's but super I don't want to miss this point. So the first question was, what is it that you feel like occupational-wise you would like to get into? Then the second question was, what's a business you would like to start? And that's what you answered. When he was going through that section, he was really trying to help you identify that one is, is where we're going to be an employee for someone, right? And the other is uh, maybe a, a business venture we would like to get in. But there was a part in that where he said, hey, you don't have to necessarily think about how you have to do all the job, right? Is there a way for you to create a business, maybe it's babysitting, where you go out and raise awareness in the neighborhood? Hey, who else out here is looking for babysitters, right? Maybe you could create a pool of your sisters and other people who would like to babysit and people contact you. And they could uh, go through you in order to book the babysitters. The same thing could be true with the uh, the walking stick business, right? Or the sewing company or whatever it may be. He he was trying to get you to think about not only could you start a business, which was really cool because he wanted you to be an entrepreneur, but also he was saying, is there a way for you to get others engaged? Did you guys resonate with that all at at that level kind of what he was talking about there how maybe you could do something or get people interested that get other people that could help perform the function of it Mm -hmm. tell me explain like where where that hit you then any it didn't hit me it didn't that that wasn't an idea that came up with you how about you zan did you think of any way to to get people involved in the the wedding business uh wedding gown business that you guys were creating (laughs) yeah we i mean it's just you have to advertise it a lot and i think that like you could use like what mr joey was about to say like you could use like social media and all that stuff to advertise for your thing yeah and And so then like you're not doing the work but you're getting the money because you can hire people and then you know get a a percentage of it yeah yeah what about you, Lily Kate? Did you have any ideas of how you could use your babysitting business to incorporate other people into it? Um, and it's okay if you didn't. I think the whole point of this yeah, we're just trying to find out what you're thinking when you read it is to challenge you, right? To challenge you to think a little bit past that point because that's not something that we naturally think of. Yeah, I didn't really think. Yeah, not not a ton. Not a ton. Okay. Well, our walking stick company had me, my cousin, my cousin Ben and Rose Davis were all in it, and eventually we were planning on getting to the we are we are planning on getting to the point where we're gonna hire our siblings to do it. Okay. Um, but yeah. 
You're just trying to get the initial product out there. I think when you start a business, a lot of times you got to got to make sure the quality's high. Yeah. Right? You got to bootstrap that thing. I mean, these are just little ideas for you as you're coming up with potential businesses that you'd like to get involved in. Just these are the questions I thought he was really poking at. It still, it needs a little time to marinate, but it's one he was thinking about how, what do you remember in the book, he said, what was one of the first businesses that he started? Do you remember during this the last library? section? Comic book? The comic book, right? And, and how, who, who did he get involved in that business with him? His sister. Yeah, he had his sister kind of acting as the librarian for the little <laughs> comic book business, right? Just a great uh, idea from there. But Stallion, you started to go into the sales aspect, which I think is really good. Yeah, I, I, I just think about that. When I, when I read the word sales or selling, it kind of has a thought, I, thought comes to mind. But I'm curious to know whenever you guys read that, he said, you know, selling is a technique, it's a strategy, it's a skill that can be used in any business. What, what came to mind like when you first heard him say that? Annie, why don't you start? And we'll go to you, Lily Kate. Um, I thought I I think of selling as marketing strategy, like getting the word of a product out so that people know that it's there so they can buy it. But is it positive or negative when you when you see that? Positive. Okay. All right, Lily Kate. I think of it as positive as well. I just it just reminds me of like people trying to shove things in your face trying to tell you to get it <laughs> get is that positive well kind of but like <laughs> i don't know i don't remember well, the last no, time that was no, positive that, to me well but see the, isn't that interesting right because there we have sometimes these negative connotations with selling and we come up with the worst types of things in our head that selling would basically exude right you were kind of given an example of shoving stuff into your face like like this pushy type of sales environment yeah, yeah. A- as compared to th- when you went to the golf store and you were looking at a new pair of golf clubs or a new pair of golf shoes and the person who was helping you do that i'm sure was probably saying well l- let me let me see how you walk and let's see all right well these pair of shoes will be a better fit for you because of the way that your walk is well now these golf clubs now let, tell me a little bit about your golf swing and how um, you, do you swing fast? Do, do you have, you know, do you, how is your stance? They probably kind of started measuring you and they said, well, I bet you these two or three sets of clubs would be a better fit because of this reason or that reason. Yeah. Now, did you know that that person was selling when they were doing that? Well, yeah. But I did think. it feel like selling? No, no. How did it feel? It kind of felt like a conversation. It felt like a conversation. It felt like probably they were helping you right? Helping you get what you wanted. Yeah. That's all sales is. Sales is helping someone purchase the things that they want. You're just doing a job of helping them see the things that match up with what they want. That is the what I would say, I think what you are getting after, uh, Joey, is how do we view this whole process of sales? And, and selling is a, a major opportunity that we all can learn from and how to do. Because he said, there's ways for you to get sales jobs. You could go work inside of a store. You could be a cashier. You could work in a, maybe as a waiter or something, moving, um, helping people get food. But he said that all of this comes back, there's an exchange. So I, there's a question I want to ask you, Alexandria. What did you think when he said about work is an exchange? Um, you exchange your time for money. And how did that make you feel when you considered that? I don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to trade time for money? Why is that? Because I want to do other things. I don't want to work all the time, but, you know, you have to. To Well, right now, it feels like you have to, you know, go in and work and then get your money. So, Kate, he said also along that line is that, you can have anything you want. You just have to exchange something for it. When you are considering that question you could ha- or that thought, you can have anything you want, but you have to exchange something for it. How did that make you feel? Like what thoughts came to mind? Well, I've been reading this book, Whatever Happened to Penny Candy, 
and it was talking about like when you go when your mom goes shopping for food she and she's gonna buy this can of beans for say a dollar um it means that the store manager values the dollar over the um, the beans and the um mom values the beans over the dollar yeah it's like so you're exchanging something to someone else for something that you want. Yes. And in in this example, he's starting to move toward work, right, Annie? He, he's trying to say a lot of times we're exchanging our work for money. And if you remember when he went through that, he was talking about sometimes when you go to work, they give you money. And at the end, when you look in your bank account, you may have this sinking feeling that the money didn't equal your work. Mm. Mm. Do you remember that part? I do. What sort of thoughts came to your mind as it relates to what your future employment could look like if that was your scenario? I I didn't like that. No? I don't want that. I want my work to equal my pay, but I also don't want to have to work for my whole life. So I want to find ways to work to to not work you you wanted to find ways where you didn't have to work where something else would be working for you yes okay russ i remember my dad specifically say to me joey you gotta go to college i don't want you to end up like me and you know what my dad was saying is in order for things to change things have to change you can't end up just like me well, I think, I mean, we, we as parents, sometimes we take on the burden thinking about our kids and, and how we want something better for them. And we want to know what will their future look like if I don't take action, if I don't do something different. See, in my house, I'm the role model. You're your kid's role model. And the buck stops with you. It's time to take action. If you're ready to take action, join us at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash passport and get started on your own journey to financial freedom. All right, let's jump back into this episode. Well, and let, let's bring it back to the point he was making in light of that, Russ, was that when you go to work to earn, many times you you look at it as if I'm working way more than I'm earning, mm. right? The, the dollars that I'm gaining are not worth the time that I'm trading for them. But when you go to work to learn, you are gaining whatever it is you were looking for, plus you got money for it. How did you guys think about that? Like, I'd love to hear, Kate, your thoughts whenever he talked about working to learn versus working to earn. What was, what, what came to mind whenever you saw that? Well, if I learned about the stuff, then I could go out and do it myself and I wouldn't have to be work. I could be the employer instead of the employee. Okay, so like gaining the experience from working for somebody would launch you into the ability to be your own business. Yes. Okay, I like that. Zan, what about you? I think like when you intern, that would be a really good way of like working to learn and not working to earn because then you can learn the trade or whatever and then you can go out and do that. That's a great point. Well, remember, Joey, we were interviewing someone not too long ago, and he was an entrepreneur. And I don't know if girls, if I shared this with you, maybe I shared it with you, Alexander, but he, he wanted to start a new business. And he said, you know, I'd been working at a company long enough to know that when we were starting any new line of business, what we would do is go interview the five top firms or five top companies or five top people in that business. And we would ask them, all that we, we could come up with, like all the things that they did. And when, Best we were, practices, yeah. when we finished, we would say, hey, could you refer me to five other people who you believe do this specific area the best? And so then he would go interview those five people, almost kind of like interning, right? It, interning is a way for you to ask the person that you're working with or the people that you're working with what they like about what they're doing, how that uh, is what they're doing, changing their life and other people's life, right? That gives you a good feeling. I think, unfortunately, sometimes two people go into college saying, well, I want to be something. Like, Alexander, I'm just going to use the example. You said, I want to be an accountant. Great, 
a lot of great things out of that, a lot of great business skills that you can get just by an accounting major. But if you actually wanted to end up being an accountant, doing tax or doing audit, you would want to spend time with somebody who did that to understand how did their work impact their lives and the lives that they of the people they work for and, and make many, sure that their answers matched up with what you would want from that thing. Yeah, and, and I think the, the other lessons that you learn in that situation is not just the skill, but how does it impact their day-to-day? And if you think, whoa, that wasn't what I expected. Like, I expected to be more free time or more of this or more of that. And they're telling me this is the reality of that, of being an architect or being an accountant, whatever it may be. Wow, what kind of value do you learn just by learning that before you were to start in that career. You know, so many people get stuck in a career because they didn't take that time. And now they, they feel like they can't change. Well, and if you've spent all this time and effort and money in the college, you may have this guilt to say, wow, if I, if I switch jobs, how will my parents feel? This individual we were interviewing had that guilt, right? He literally quit his job without telling his parents, started driving across the country to California from Maryland to start this new business and waited in, until he was over halfway across the country to tell his parents he was gone. Because <laughs> he said, I was just so nervous of what they would do or what they may say. That's and, right. and that's a natural feeling. All right, so going into this, he, he talked about once we start earning money, it's important to have a place that we put those dollars. Lily Kate, he talked about having three piggy banks. Do you remember that in the story? Uh, yes, sir. All right. When, when he talked about the, uh, the what three, were the piggy, three piggy, banks, piggy banks, share, share what those three piggy banks um, were for. What, what, how did he separate what went in each piggy bank? There were savings, charity, and investments. All right. So why was it so important for him to share something about charity? Didn't he mean like like tithe? Yeah, right. So, but he said it. Th- there were there were some important things to giving money to other people. And do you remember like some of the takeaways or just thoughts you had when he he talked about the importance of giving money to someone else? Well, he said that um, to be truly rich, we need to give as well as we receive. Mm. And um, I didn't really agree with that necessarily i thought um it was a little manipulative like you should be giving much more than you should be keeping for yourself and um when he said that that about giving money um he said that giving money is one of the best ways to help right the wrongs of our world and um it is a good way to help but it's it can't right the wrongs and um only jesus can do that but I disagreed with what he said a lot about the charity. Interesting. That, that, and anybody else have any other thoughts on charity and your opinion on it? Dan? Okay, no. All right, well then let, let's talk about, Kate, you want to talk about the, he said the other piggy bank was for savings. What's important about taking a portion of the money that we make and put it in a way for a rainy day? Well, if you put it in a bank, then you can create a different investment on it. But I don't think he seemed to like savings a lot. Well, he, <laughs> he actually addressed that pretty well, didn't he? Say, what did he say, Joey, as it related to savings? Why did banks want you to save money? Well, <laughs> well, we always talk about this on the show, but um, banks are just trying to entice you to keep your money with them so that they can go and put it to work, yeah. lend it to others. That's their whole business model. So. They're trying to give you a little, just enough to make you want to leave it with them so they can use it. Yeah. All right, Suzanne, the last piggy bank was for investments. Yes. Out of the three, it seemed like he really liked this one the most. (laughs) Yeah. That's how he thought you could, like, make money easily because you can put your money into something that you feel like is a good investment. And then you can get your money back from it. Well, all right. So I I want to address this, right? Because you said the word easy. Is investing easy? Well, I guess you have to make make 
wise decisions about where you put your money. Okay. So in order to make a wise decisions, we have to know something about what we're investing in, right? And in our world, we we talk to people all the time who who are coming to us because they want to get out of Wall Street, which is a place where people invest money. At least they think they're investing. Technically, they're gambling. Yep. They're speculating. They're hoping. But they're often told they're investing. And when asked about how much they know about where their money is, they don't. They have little or no understanding. And when we explain to them where their money is, they realize they have little or no influence on its result. When you're investing, Lily Kane, would you like to have influence over its ability to come back to you? Um, what do you mean by that? Well, if you were to give me $100 for an investment, would you like to know that you had a higher than likelihood that I would give it back to you? Would that be important to you that you might get your money back? Yes. Yes. Well, would you like to be able to influence through maybe your work or your input or uh, your ability to sell or help it to make more money? Yes, sir. That would be good, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So when he's going through those three piggy banks, and he says even to this day he keeps three piggy banks as symbolic to reminding him of those three areas. Well, I agree with you, Annie. His form of charity is not our, necessarily what I would say is our form, but I still think there's good into giving, right, and considering giving. There's good into saving. There's good in knowing that we should pay ourselves first. He referenced a book called The Richest Man of Babylon, something that your dad and I are going through right now and, and sharing the, the benefits. And one of the, the first lessons in that book is that uh, every um, – there's a portion of everything you make is yours to keep. <laughs> There's value in knowing that we should be saving. But then also the third, uh, some of that money should be put to create new money and that's buying assets. And, and who, who remembers what he declared as the form of how you define an asset? Return on investment. Okay. That, and how does, so it's return of cash flow on the investment, right? Mm -hmm. When we have money coming back to us, those would be money that goes in your pocket. Something that puts money in your pocket, right, is an asset. Yeah. So, but, but I want to back up a second, Russ. You kind of glazed over this. What did you guys uh, understand it to mean when he said, pay yourself first? Like, I think, Russ, if it's okay, most people have gone through their whole lives and they don't understand that key simple thing. So if we could, at this age, understand it, that would be pretty amazing. So I'd love to hear. Um, so, Kate, what do, you, what do you think it means when he says pay yourself first? Pay myself before putting money into investments, into savings. Okay. All right. Why do you think that? The way he explained it. Okay. All right. What, what's important about paying yourself before you start paying for everything else? Because if you don't pay yourself, then you're not gaining any value on it. If you make um, your business that doesn't have enough money to pay yourself, then it's probably not. Well, uh, Alexandria, let's just assume you made $100. If, if you went out immediately and spent all $100, would that be a benefit to you? No, you would You'd lose it. You wouldn't have anything yeah, to show for it, right? And he talked about that. So many people, that as soon as they get paid, the first thing they do is go spend every dollar. And, and in our world, what we would say is people do is they, it's not like they just go buy something that's a one-time thing. It's even worse than that. What do they do? They go buy things that have monthly payments associated with them. And so then now they, for every dollar they, they have coming in, they have that monthly payment to pay for that thing, right? Now they become a slave to that job, right? This is when he talks about the rat race and people are in the rat race. They're constantly going round and round waiting for the paycheck. So the purpose then, okay, for paying yourself first would be to know that you would always have some of the money for you, that all of it isn't intended for somebody else so that when your money comes in, you don't immediately think, I've got to go spend it. 
Yeah. So, so to, to back up what you're talking about, Russ, is we're going to put money into those kind of those buckets because how many people want to be charitable and giving, but yet they've never started by putting that first 10% at least back to give to the Lord. And they wait till the end of the month and how much of that is left to give? It's gone, right? right. So you can't be charitable unless you pay yourself first. And by that meaning, pay God first, like give him the first fruits of your labor, that first 10%, then save, then invest and the rest we live off of. So all those buckets he was talking about are quote unquote, paying yourself first. And I think that's so critical. Well, in this, he was talking about, it's oftentimes that people will go into debt and he used the term, Annie, good debt versus bad debt. What was your understanding of the two? Um, I understood that good debt is managing debt and bad debt is trying to pay off the debt fully. Okay. Anybody else have a different take on it? Bad debt is when you just pay the minimal payment. Okay. And so then you pay more um, interest than you actually pay for the thing. Yeah. Cause he gave an example of someone who gets a credit card. Mm -hmm. and they don't relate to the money that they're spending throughout the month because it's just this piece of plastic. And a lot of times you can do this little signature thing and it's gone. And then all of a sudden the bill comes in the mail. And what happens on the statement? Do you remember he said you, there's the full balance, but then do you have to pay the full balance? Mm -hmm. What he said, there's a, this little minimum balance. You're like, Oh, well that's not too bad. <laughs> I can do that. I can afford to pay that. And if, if somebody chooses to pay that, then they're not paying for the actual goods that they bought. They're just starting to pay some of the interest on the goods. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening then? They go into debt. They go into a lot of debt. They go into a lot of debt. Did you know our country is actually doing that as we speak? I, I literally sent a message to your dad and, and to our other coaches this morning. I was reading an article, and, and from the article it said, the White House budget proposal reflects a shift in their thinking that focuses on keeping interest payments on the government debt in check rather than eliminating deficits over the next decade. That means deficits would mean they are spending more than they make. And instead of trying to write that, they're just trying to pay just the interest. Instead of paying for what's being spent, just like we just said, they're just trying to manage the interest payments. Did you guys realize that the government had credit cards? They have a, like a big credit card. credit card. The, the credit card they're getting ready to propose is $6 trillion just for this next upcoming fiscal year. $6 trillion. And what they want to do is make the minimum payments on it as opposed to paying the debt that they already owe. And what they want to put on the credit card for this year. You are learning this right now at 15 and 13 years old. We have career politicians who have not figured this out. <laughs> right? I mean, is that scary to you? But here's the beauty is that you're learning it. And everything that we do is compared to someone else. So there are people that are going to be doing that and are going to constantly be fighting to get to the top of the water. They're underneath the water drowning struggling to get to the top of the water for air and you can build yourself a lifeboat on top of it by just understanding these simple financial concepts. Joey, one of the last questions you, you had here, which I really like, was how would you explain what happens when credit cards, when they get out of control? So if you were to have a credit card and, and not have paid it off, how do you think that would make you feel just based upon the conversation we just had? Um, it would make me feel awful. It reminds me of um, an episode of Saved by the Bell. Did, <laughs> did you ever see that growing up? I love Saved by the Bell. Yeah, Screech. A.C. Slater. A.C. Slater. Zach. Come on. Come on now. Well, our mom introduced us to it um, <laughs> a, like a month ago. So we've been watching the episodes ever since. 
And we just got the season two and we saw an episode called the Lisa card where <laughs> Lisa right. Turtle <laughs> spends a bunch of money on her dad's credit card and can't take the clothes back that she bought. So she has all this debt on his credit card that she has to pay off. And um, it, 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 that's kind of what I think about when I think of credit card debt because she was drowning under all that debt and she had to pay it all back to her dad. And she was trying to come up with ways to make money. She was like selling her clothes and working at a diner. <laughs> and she thought her dad would hate her because she had all this debt. And so that's why that's what I think about when I think of credit card debt. How about you, Luke? Can you have any other thoughts differently than that? Yeah, that's essentially what I think about now that I've seen that episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, remember, I, here's one of the things, if you remember this, uh, Alexander or, or Kate, when you were reading through, he talked about there is this inclination that, man, I can just pay the minimum payment on that balance because it might be hard because I might have spent more than what I had. He said, but don't, don't accept that. You can actually try to fight against it. The creativity of trying to figure out what to do differently might actually be good for you. Could you think of like, if you were forced to make a payment that you didn't have all the money for, what would it make you do? I'd probably go get a job. What if you already had a job? Do double shifts. What if you were already working double shifts? I don't know. Create okay. more opportunities, I guess. Create opportunities. Yeah. Like well, that's what he's saying. He's like, when you're forced to actually consider other options, that is when excellence happened. The book Becoming Your Own Banker was spawned out of nights where Mr. Nelson Nash was sitting there. He was, he was knee deep in debt. He did not know what to do. And he was forcing himself to try to figure out how does he get out of that circumstance and an idea hitting. That's right. Right. He, he, he said was it, forced to he, get creative. He was, he, he was forced to come up with a new idea. Well, girls, I really appreciate you um, going through this book with us. I appreciate you sharing it. There's other teenagers watching this right now who are, are like, wow, I, I never even considered that I should be reading and learning these things. You've been an inspiration to them. Maybe even some of them are cute boys. <laughs> it's not I'm, I'm just saying, well, okay. we, We'll, we'll hold off until they're about 27 and you guys can <laughs> come let us know. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> well, no, but I also say that I bet you that um, you've inspired some adults because what you know now at your age, there's a lot of people, as we just discussed, a lot of people sitting in Washington, D.C. that don't understand this. And you are going to be so much better because of it. And I know we had a lot of fun doing it with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It was fun to do. Okay, so last thoughts here as we're wrapping up. What would you say to somebody who uh, is considering doing this with their kids? What would be your your feedback or your last words for them? Danny, why don't you start? Most definitely go go forward and do it. It will help you and them much Lily. more than you know. Lily Kay. Um, To just take this knowledge and use it towards your life. And your decisions. All right, Zan. I would tell them to do it, and but I would tell them to like read through it a little bit faster than we did. We kind of, <laughs> we kind of. I was took waiting a on couple that. months. Yeah, to do that. I was waiting. On That's that. okay. How about you, Katie? Any final thoughts for somebody considering this? Do it. Do it. All do right. it. There you go. Just do it, man. We gotta put that put that as a slogan somewhere. Write that down. Well, as always, we really appreciate you listening to this episode and all episodes. If there's a family that you know that would benefit from this book, uh, please share this episode with them and then go and give us uh, a review. That's how other people who are not being referred this find it is because they, um, the podcast listing shows will, will, will bump up shows like this just based upon your feedback and your reviews. So it's always really valuable when you do that. So we appreciate you. And as always, have an amazing day. Bye, guys. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset. 
and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.